Jeremiah 34, beginning at verse 1. While Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and all his army, and all the kingdoms and peoples in the empire he ruled, were fighting against Jerusalem and all its surrounding towns, this word came to Jeremiah from the Lord. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Go to Zedekiah, king of Judah, and tell him, this is what the Lord says. I am about to to give this city into the hands of the king of Babylon, and he will burn it down. You will not escape from his grasp, but will surely be captured and given into his hands. You will see the king of Babylon with your own eyes, and he will speak to you face to face, and you will go to Babylon. Yet hear the Lord's promise to you, Zedekiah, king of Judah. This is what the Lord says concerning you. You will not die by the sword. You will die peacefully. As people made a funeral fire in honor of your predecessors, the kings who ruled before you, so they will make a fire in your honor and lament, Alas, master, I myself make this promise, declares the Lord. Then Jeremiah the prophet told all this to Zedekiah, king of Judah. In Jerusalem, while the army of the king of Babylon was fighting against Jerusalem and the other cities of Judah that were still holding out, Lachish and Azekah, these were the only fortified cities left in Judah. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. And let's pray. Give our thanks to God. Father in heaven, thank you for your mercies towards us. Thank you for the word of God, which speaks to us. It, it speaks clearly concerning the things which we must know and believe for salvation. It is the rule of faith and practice that you've given to your church, not to be appropriated merely individualistically. It is in the church for the growth of the people of God and the the evangelization of the world. So as we read it in concert with our elders and teachers, Lord, teach us. You've made it clear what we need to know. You will grow us in knowledge as we study it together. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We are coming tonight to the end of the book of Jeremiah and our overview of this major prophet. This is our ninth message from this book, but we will conclude the book this evening. And as we have looked at the first 33 chapters, they have been full of Jeremiah's warnings to the people, the oncoming threat of judgment, and declared in the prophetic style that we see often in the prophets, like sermons that are recorded for us to read. Now, as we saw over the past few weeks, once you get to chapters 30 to 33, you finally get a breath of fresh air of mercy and grace because Jeremiah very much emphasizes the oncoming judgment exactly as God told him to do. When you come to those middle chapters, mercy is held out to say, despite the coming judgment, there will still be the renewal of God's people, the renewal of the covenant that will accomplish the Lord's salvation in his time. But as we come out of that section, so we come to the end. And once again, the focus is on the Lord's judgment. But what makes these last sections unique is it's the historical realization of it. So in other words, whereas the first chapters read like a prophet, these last chapters read a lot like First and Second Kings. In fact, a lot of the material in the chapters that we will overview tonight are in Second Kings, sometimes almost verbatim, leading some to suspect that Jeremiah may have been the principal author of the book of Second Kings. But what you have in these last chapters then is God keeping his word. Throughout each section, we've highlighted how the Lord uh, does something unique to that section, whether renewing the covenant or, or threatening the nation. If you put a heading on chapters 34 through 45, it would be that God enforces covenant consequences. And the overarching message of, book, of the book of Jeremiah is that God enforces the covenant, both good and ill. Here the focus is on the consequences. God enforces covenant consequences. Now, having said that, this is the great, gracious God we serve and adore. His judgment is never without mercy. And the events that you read in these chapters span 20 years. So it shows God's mercy. He warns and he warns and he warns. And when the people will not hear, then God's judgment comes. That is great patience on the part of our God who owes us nothing 
and yet in mercy shows kindness to his people. Sadly, you see this played out, especially in Revelation. This is a strong theme in the book of Revelation. God's patience does not change their hearts. The people continue to disobey. They are hardened in their rebellion, and so judgment comes. So let me just take you through the main events. Just just highlight the main events of each chapter here as we see God keeping his word. In the opening verses that we read tonight, chapter 34, 1 through 7, Jeremiah twice assures Zedekiah, and this is Judah's final king, by the way, remember Jeremiah flip-flops historically. We'll even see a little bit of that if you notice the names tonight. But this dated from the time of Judah's final king, Zedekiah. Jer- Jeremiah twice assures him that Babylon will fall, that, or that Jerusalem will fall at the hands of Babylon. That there's, there's no getting out of it. There's no escaping it. He himself will not die. He himself is said to have a peaceful death. Now, he is captured and his eyes are put out and then he is taken to Babylon. So his death may be peaceful, but nonetheless, he will still suffer. Now, we could view that as because he continued to disobey the word here in chapter 34, some of that mercy was taken away as he suffered greatly. He tried to escape and he was apprehended. Nonetheless, God keeps his word. He's taken to Babylon and he does die a peaceful death there in exile. Now, as you come into the rest of chapter 34, you have three stories and they're like what we saw in Mark. They're gonna sandwich a central story. So you have two stories of disobedience. They're at the end of of 34 and all of 36. Two stories of disobedience. Chapter 35, though, there is actually a story of obedience within the kingdom. So it's an intentional contrast to show the depth of sin in the nation, and yet God still has his remnant people. The first story of disobedience there in chapter 34, verses 8 through 22, occurs when the Judahites free their slaves in obedience to the Mosaic law. If you're familiar with the laws concerning slaves, every certain number of years you were to free them. There were to be jubilee years. There were times when sold property would revert to its original owners, debts would be canceled, fields would lay fallow, and uh, slaves would be set free. God building mercy and grace into the very structure of Israel's society. Well, the Judahites keep that law. Perhaps with judgment coming, they're thinking, hey, you, you know, we, we can win God. Let's do something right. Maybe that's their attitude. Let's do something right and perhaps earn God's favor in the face of judgment. It could have also been ill-motivated. If we free these slaves, there's more manpower perhaps for the army. So regardless of their motive, it's not good because they soon break the covenant. They go back and reapprehend their slaves. Perhaps there's, there's remember, Babylon came in waves. So perhaps Babylon comes, they free the slaves, things subside. It's like in the book of Judges. Now that things are good, let's go back to our wicked ways. And they uh, re-enlist these slaves, thus leading to God's condemnation. So the story of disobedience. You come into chapter 35, though, and you read about a family known as the Rechabites, a family that lives in Jerusalem. And they had an ancestor, Jehonadab. And he gave his descendants a command. Do not drink wine, do not build houses, and do not build crops. Or, or, you know, build crops. Plant crops, all right? Don't do any of those three things. Now, we're not told the reason why. Was it that this ancestor, you know, could see the blessings that God was given and realize their ultimate spiritual significance, and so is trying to get his family to look toward ultimate reality. We've we've talked about this a little bit in our studies about the land that God gives Abraham is is really just a symbol pointing to new creation and heaven on earth. Did, Did he realize those things? Or maybe it was, remember the commands to Jeremiah, don't marry, don't go to funerals. Maybe this ancestor foresaw judgment that was coming. And so he told his family, you know, don't settle down here. 
Don't put down those kinds of roots. Realize that this nation is headed in a bad way and one day exile is going to come and don't live in that way. We're not told the exact reason why I gave the command. What's interesting about the command is all the things that he asked him to abstain from are things that God in his word says would be part of the blessings of living in the promised land. You can note Deuteronomy 28, 2 through 8. So the things that he's telling them not to do were actually things that God was telling Israel, this is what I will give you if you are faithful to me. I will bless you in those areas. That, that, that makes me really wonder if his abstention was looking ahead to God's coming judgment. And again, like Jeremiah, abstaining from those things that God had given, even though they were his blessings, much like Jeremiah doesn't marry, does not go to funerals, etc. But notice the point God makes of it. Whatever his motive may have been, it just highlights the disobedience of the Judahites. Look at verse 12 of chapter 35. Then the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah saying, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel says, go and tell the people of Judah and those living in Jerusalem, will you not learn a lesson and obey my words, declares the Lord? Jehonadab, son of Rechab, ordered his descendants not to drink wine and this command has been kept. To this day, they do not drink wine because they obey their forefathers' command. But I have spoken to you again and again, yet you have not obeyed me. Again and again, I sent all my servants, the prophets, to you. They said, each of you must turn from your wicked ways and reform your actions. Do not follow other gods or serve them. Then you will live in the land I have given to you and your ancestors. But you have not paid attention or listened to me. The descendants of Jehonadab, son of Rechab, have carried out the command their forefather gave them. But these people have not obeyed me. It's a contrast. They can keep the command of their forefather for hundreds of years. And you can't listen to me even though I send the prophets over and over again. It's a living rebuke to the people. So then coming into chapter 36, the other side of the sandwich, one more story of disobedience, Jeremiah writes up a portion of his prophecy and it is sent to Jehoiakim. See the time flip-flop, he's one of the earlier kings. And when the religious leaders learn of it, they tell Jeremiah, you better hide, he's not gonna be happy when he hears this. And as the scroll comes to the king, he says, read it to me. And as they start to read it, he says, cut that part off, throw it in the fire. Read a little bit more, cut that part off, throw it into the fire. The more they read, the more he cuts off and throws into the fire. He will not hear the words of God. By the way, God tells Jeremiah to rewrite it. And once again, God's word is not lost. It is preserved. So you have there in chapters 34 and 35 and 36, these stories of disobedience. Chapters 37 through 39 then are the final days of Judah. Again, historical narrative reads like Second Kings. In chapter 37, Jeremiah is imprisoned. He is thrown into a cistern, a, a, a filthy, dank, wet place. But some hear of it and in compassion go and secure his release. He's not released completely. He's just imprisoned in the courtyard. So still in prison, but better circumstances from the cistern to the courtyard. Now throughout, and that's in chapter 38. Now throughout those two chapters, King Zedekiah pays him several private visits. So it kind of reminds me of Herod. Remember, he liked to hear John, but he, he wouldn't free him, but he wouldn't pay him to death. The king comes and he, and he listens to Jeremiah, but, but he doesn't listen. He doesn't do what Jeremiah says to do. He goes back and forth between, all right, yeah, imprison Jeremiah based on what the people want. Then when some other people say, set him free, yeah, set him free. He's a man without conviction, a man without integrity, a man without God's word to anchor him. And so as we come into chapter 39, we read of the fall of Jerusalem and Judah. Again, over the course of many years, three waves of invasions, but the third was the final, the walls are broken down, the temple is destroyed, and the rest, the majority of the rest of the population is taken into exile. Coming into chapter 40, by the way, the, the Babylonians offered Jeremiah his freedom. No big surprise there. Jeremiah had been saying to surrender 
to Babylon. Now, Jeremiah had a spiritual reason for it. God said so, and that which saved the lives of many in Judah. Babylon didn't really care what his motivation is. This guy's been saying, surrender to us. So yeah, if you want to come to Babylon and have a good life, come on. But Jeremiah refuses. He stays in Judah with the poorest citizens. That's who they left in the land. Just just leave a remnant population to keep the place from completely falling apart. And the poor citizens stay behind. And Jeremiah chooses to stay with them. Shows his loyalty to God great love for neighbor, that these people who have oppressed him, that he would stay with them. And you'd think, friends, that maybe now things settle down for Judah and for Jeremiah, but no. The Babylonians appoint a governor, one Gedaliah, to govern the land of Judah, but later some Jewish refugees under the leadership of one named Ishmael, who is of royal blood, they return to uh, Judah and they assassinate Gedaliah. He was warned it would happen. People had gotten word. He said, no, it won't happen. And it happened. And when that happens, the remaining citizens flee down to Egypt for safety. And we're here in chapters 40 through 41. Why would they do that? Well, again, the battles that catch Israel are battles between Babylon and in Egypt. If you're going to get to Egypt and fight them, you have to go through Israel. Same thing with Babylon. So, so much of this is Israel just caught in the middle. Yet God in his providence uses it to judge them for their sin. Well, they've been defeated by Babylon, so let, we just killed the Babylonian governor. Let's flee down here into Egypt. And while they're down there in Egypt, they continue their idolatry. And listen to the folly of their thinking. They think it's their lack of loyalty to the Egyptian gods that enabled Babylon to conquer them. This is recorded in chapter 44. They'd broken their covenant with God and they made a covenant with Egypt. And now they're saying the reason Babylon won is, well, we we just weren't faithful enough to Egypt's gods. There is a faithfulness problem, but it's not Egypt's gods. And so God, once again, through Jeremiah, warns them of idolatry. He announces he can find them even in Egypt. He will punish them even down there. And here's the one thing Jeremiah has going for him this time. History is on his side. They've seen God's words come true in Babylon or in Judah. They need to heed God's words in Egypt. Let me read you one last verse from this section in chapter 45, verse 5. God has a message in this very short chapter to Baruch. And Baruch is almost a forgotten character. This is Jeremiah's scribe. This is Jeremiah's disciple. Now, when you think about it, he's been with Jeremiah through a lot of these problems. He's gone through his own suffering and opposition. And that has influenced his thinking to put him in a point where he has struggled to be self-seeking. And God warns him in verse 5. Look at 45, 5. Should you then seek great things for yourself? Do not seek them. For I will bring disaster on all people, declares the Lord. But wherever you go, I will let you escape with your life. In other words, Baruch, now's the time when you should just be grateful to be alive. So don't be thinking of yourself and your opportunities and what you can accomplish. Here's the encouraging note. God's going to be with you wherever you go. So you serve the Lord wherever your suffering places you. And I think that's a pastoral message we can all take away from Jeremiah's prophecy. No matter what God does in history and how that may affect your life, for good or for ill, God is with you wherever you go. And so don't worry about, well, I want this opportunity. This this would be really great. He'll give you the opportunities that are needed. You seek him, you go with him, and it will be good for your soul in his glory. Now let's come to these last chapters of the book of Jeremiah. When we leave in chapter 45, uh, Judah is destroyed. Uh, The people have fled to Egypt. There'll be one more historical note that the very last chapter, 52, will speak once again of Jerusalem's fall and the temple's destruction. But in between there, in between 45 and 52, you have one last major section, chapters 46 through 51, where God speaks to the nations. So to title this section, we could say God judges the nations. God enforces the covenant consequences on his people. 
But what about all the other nations in the world? And this is stated in the scriptures. God isn't in covenant with them like he was with Israel. You know, the details of the covenant in 2 Chronicles 7, 14, that that is God speaking to Israel on the terms of the agreement he's made with them. But what about all these other nations? Are they therefore, uh, you know, off the hook? Can they live however they want? No, God will hold them accountable too. And he tells us exactly how in these chapters. Like other prophets, Jeremiah addresses the nations. He addresses Egypt, the Philistines, Moab, Ammon, Edom, Damascus, the capital of Syria, uh, north of Israel, Kedar and Hatzor, Elam, and finally, the longest section, Babylon, in chapters 50 through 51. And three themes emerge from these messages. I'll list them for you. I think they give us a real good idea of how to pray for our nation as well as other nations. How does God hold the nations of the world accountable? Well, when Jeremiah is preaching and warning these nations, he first of all zeroes in, like many of the other prophets, on the theme of arrogance, that the other nations are arrogant, that they trust in their riches, they trust in their personal prowess, their power, they trust in their national wisdom, they trust in their military might. And God is warning them against self-sufficiency. It's really the very same warning he gives every individual sinner, right? Don't trust in your own works. Don't trust in your own righteousness, Philippians 3. Well, as that attitude is, is inculcated in a person and in a people group and in a nation, you have the same warning on a corporate level. Do not be trusting in your own abilities or your own powers. Recognize who exalts and who puts down, which leads right into the second criticism. Do not trust in false gods. All of these other nations follow false gods. They have their own gods, their own trust, but they don't trust the one true and living God, the God who has revealed himself from heaven. Now, Israel was to be the light to the nations, and they weren't, but the other nations are still warned not to trust in false gods. Psalm thirty-three, twelve: blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people he chose for his inheritance. Righteousness exalts a nation, Proverbs declares, but sin is a reproach to any people. So you may not be in covenant with God like Israel was, but sin is always bad for a people group. Righteousness is good and trust in the Lord is needed. And so I think that gives us some real good wisdom on how to pray for the nation in which we live. And that goes regardless of which party has influence, power, or authority, that they are a people who know the Lord, that they acknowledge their limited powers, their limited place, that they make God their God and that they serve and follow him. First Timothy 2 reinforces that. Pray for your leaders that they might be saved. And third, by the way, the third theme is persecution for God's people. These rival nations harass the people of God. And while we see that played out nationally in the Old Testament, that doesn't change as we come into the New Testament. The people of God, the church, Peter addresses them as the exiles who are scattered about. So God's people finding themselves in the different nations of the world may still experience harassment at the hands of national powers. And you are to pray then that they would come to know the Lord and that that might Cease. Now you got to balance it because remember, what, what did Jeremiah tell the people going into exile in Babylon? He said, now you pray for the welfare of this nation. You pray that it prospers. You pray for its peace. It's good that there be jobs and food for people to eat and that the nation be in a tranquil situation. So you, you, he tells them, build houses when you get to Babylon. You're not going anywhere anytime soon. You build houses, put down roots. You're strangers in a foreign land, but you live there. To the best you can of the glory of God, you pray for their welfare. Things we balance, that God would bless where we find ourselves and that he would turn hearts to him. And at the end, by the way, uh, chapters 50 and 51, Babylon receives the most attention. No surprise, Babylon's the main persecutor of God's people here. And so God's message to Jeremiah, here's your grace once again. One day, Babylon will be ruined and Israel will be restored. That's the note on which Jeremiah begins to end his book. Despite all the judgment that's been pronounced, 
despite their violation of the covenant. God has an unbreakable covenant purpose that he'll make that new covenant that'll restore his people. He'll put down all of his and our enemies. When you see that language in the Psalm, you, you, you understand that in the spiritual sense of sin and Satan and the enemies of the people of God, God will put them down. He will bless and establish his people. And that's why, by the way, it's foolish for them to resist Babylon. You don't need to assassinate this governor. You don't need to go hide in Egypt. God's going to put them down. Don't you worry about how everything's going to work out nationally, he tells them. You serve God faithfully. You trust and focus on his redemptive purposes, and he will not let you down. Look at chapter 51, the end verses there, beginning at verse 59. This message of hope is what God sends to the exiles in Babylon. Chapter 51, beginning at verse 59. This is the message Jeremiah the prophet gave to the staff officer, Sariah, son of Neriah, the son of Messiah, when he went to Babylon with Zedekiah, king of Judah, in the fourth year of his reign. Jeremiah had written on a scroll about all the disasters that would come upon Babylon, all that had been recorded concerning Babylon. He said to Sariah, when you get to Babylon, see that you read all these words aloud. Then say, Lord, you have said you will destroy this place so that neither people nor animals will live in it. It will be desolate forever. When you finish reading this scroll, tie a stone to it and throw it in the Euphrates. Then say, so will Babylon sink to rise no more because of the disaster I will bring on her and her people will fall. The words of Jeremiah end here. Now, maybe that answers our question earlier. Now we know why Jeremiah didn't take Babylon's offer to go live with them. It wasn't going to be any better with them than it was in Israel. But this is his message of hope to the exiles. God will bring them down. When you go into your New Testament, you read Revelation 17, 18, God finally brings judgment on an evil, hostile world system. He describes it as Babylon. The, the, the city becomes emblematic, representative of hostile spiritual powers. Like we studied this morning with the mountain, God says, I'll remove it in my kingdom. We'll triumph. So finally, chapter 52, the book ends with Jerusalem's fall and the temple's total destruction. But if you just look your eye, I won't read the verses, but if you just look your eye at the very last verses, 31 through 34, you read of the release of Jehoiachin, one of the kings who had been captured earlier and taken into exile in Babylon. Eventually, he is released. The king shows him, not released fully, but he's, he's out of prison and in the royal court there, supported by the king. Why in a book like this? Because like so many of the prophets, they look ahead to a coming redeemer, a coming king, a coming savior. And so Jeremiah ends by saying, God knows where that kingly line is. He's keeping it alive and he intends to fulfill and keep his promises. So let's trust in those, make those our hope. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, you are so good and you are so kind. Thank you for the wisdom that you give us as people living in our nation. We can be involved, uh, responsible, good citizens that work and pray for the good of our communities. And yet we keep our eyes ultimately on your redemptive purposes. We seek first the kingdom of God we have faith that you will remove mountains of opposition and we trust your redemptive promises. Now, Lord, help us because our faith is weak at times. We don't believe those. We doubt them. We get discouraged when we see opposition or maybe our minds become fixed elsewhere. We're just not kingdom minded. We're laboring for everything else. Lord, help us to get the balance of the Christian life right. That whatever calling you've given us in this life as doctors or as landscapers or as nurses, whatever calling you've given us, we do it well to the glory of God. And we would do it well in a way where we are also looking for your redemptive purposes to triumph. And I pray this for our congregation here. I pray you bless us with wisdom in that area. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. And let's go out and sing. 185. When I survey... 
the wondrous cross. Stand with me, please, in 185.